this morning, I will be presenting a short case of uh, ritual pharyngeal abscess, a case that uh, we just recently managed in our center. So the parents of this patient get the verbal consent and uh, have no copyright, uh, no copyright infringement intended in the making of these slides. So the case is a five-year-old male who presented to the OPD uh, with a six-day history of throat pain and uh, which was insidious in onset and then progressed over the following days before presentation. There was associated five-day history of dysphagia, and, uh, which was initially too solid and then later became uh, worsened and child was not able to swallow the saliva. And then three days prior to presentation, he developed fever, uh, which was initially low grade and then later became high grade. He had associated odinophagia, muffled voice, neck swelling. He also had strido and some difficulty in breathing at presentation, but there was no nasal autologic symptoms and no loss of consciousness, convulsion, no cough or chest pain. There was an antecedent history of ingestion of fish bone a week prior to the onset of symptoms, no history of immunosuppressive disease or sickle cell uh, disease in, in the patient. He's from a low socioeconomic background, as both parents are peasant farmers. So uh, on presentation, the child was ill-looking, warm to touch, pale, dehydrated, with a temperature of 37.8 uh, degrees centigrade. He was tachycardic, and the uh, uh, respiratory rate was 22 cycles per minute. The SpO2 fluctuates between 94 to 98% uh, at room air. So the oral cavity oropharynx examination revealed uh, the presence of trismus. He had poor oral hygiene. He was drooling saliva from the oral cavity, and uh, but the tonsils appeared normal. There was uh, a bulge on the posterior pharyngeal wall on the left side, which was uh, bulging uh, anteriorly and aborting with a soft palate. Uh, he also had a firm tender anterior neck swelling on the right side. Uh, somehow anterior to the anterior, anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid with some diffused edema on the lower part of the anterior, central part of the anterior neck. The other uh, systemic examination of the ear, nose, and uh, other systems uh, revealed no significant findings of note. So this is the clinical photograph of the patient at presentation. As you can see, he was drooling saliva. He was both pulling and drooling. And uh, there is this diffused swelling on the uh, right side, mainly anterior to the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, state. And uh, this diffused edema around the lower part of the central compartment of the neck. So he had some investigations done, uh, which include uh, free blood count differentials and, uh, here and the urea creatinine. Uh, the result revealed mild anemia and uh, leukocyto significant leukocytosis with predominance of uh, neutrophilia. And the uh, uh, renal function test was essentially normal. So the X-rays of tissue neck that he had, as you can see from the right, uh, the right picture here, he had a straightening of the cervical lordosis. And uh, there is this uh, huge uh, widening of the prevertebral soft tissue shadow extending all the way from C2 down to uh, C7 from this picture, and then also compressing the laryngeal, oropharyngeal, and tracheal air column. Then, uh, so the child was resuscitated with a refluid, analgesia, antibiotics, and uh, so he was prepared for surgery and then taken for uh, emergency uh, incision and drainage in the theater and he had the intraoral access uh, or approach to the drainage. About, uh, as you can see from the first picture here, though not very clear, but uh, somehow hyperemic, the arrow, this arrow is pointing to the posterior pharyngeal bulge, and the test aspirate in the second picture here revealed uh, purulence. About 18 mils of uh, pores was drained ultimately uh, from the incision and drainage. And uh, while incising and draining, we stumble across uh, on this foreign body, which is a fish bone impacted uh, within the retropharyngeal space. It measures about uh, one centimeter in length. 
So the specimen was uh, sent for microscopy culture and sensitivity, which yielded the uh, staph aureus and uh, Fusobacterium, and the child was treated according to sensitivity pattern. So one week post-operative, uh, all symptoms have resolved and the patient has commenced uh, oral feeding. He was discharged and at the moment he is to be seen in the clinic for his follow-up. So just a bit of literature review on the management of uh, retropharyngeal abscess. Uh, retropharyngeal abscess is a potentially life-threatening infection uh, commonly seen in children, usually less than five years of age. Although this entity is uh, being reported to be rare, uh, especially with the advent of uh, specific antibiotics. Uh, uh, however, the true incidence of uh, retropharyngeal abscess is really underreported, as uh, reported in some series. Uh, the infection is often uh, acute, seen acutely acute in children and then chronic in adults, uh, meaning the children usually present with acute infection while adults tend to present with the chronic type of the infection. It is usually associated with a low socioeconomic status and sometimes immunosuppressive disease. So the just a bit of anatomy of the retropharyngeal space. The retropharynx is a, a potential space that is uh, located posterior to the bucopharyngeal space and then anterior to the privatable fascia. It is divided into two, right and left, by a median rough, and uh, it communicates uh, laterally to, with the parapharyngeal spaces. And uh, usually in children, uh, especially children less than five, this space contains lymph nodes in the medial aspect and also in the lateral aspect. So, But by the age of uh, five to 10, mostly, uh, this lymph node uh, usually regresses. So what happens is that uh, this lymph node receives drainage from most head and neck uh, regions, such as the parapharynx, the nose, and also the middle ear. So when there is infection, it can easily spread to this uh, lymph node. And as you can see from the pathophysiology, just a schematic diagram here, uh, infection usually spread to the parapharyngeal space, and then the lymph nodes gets infected. That leads to superative adenitis, and then superative adenitis usually will elicit retropharyngeal cellulitis. And this will subsequently lead to formation of abscess. So the abscess could either expand and then cause obstruction, uh, upper airway obstruction, or may spread to other contiguous uh, uh, deep neck spaces. Usually the infection is polymicrobial, including anaerobes. So the usual presentation, uh, especially in the early period of uh, retropharyngeal abscess, uh, one needs a very high index of suspicion because at this in this period, the symptoms may resemble just some acute uh, pharyngitis or tonsillitis. And uh, so that time the patient may present with sore throat, fever, uh, dysphagia or dysphagia. However, there are some uh, bit of red flags that one must look for, uh, especially the onset of muffled voice in the setting of sore throat, fever, dysphagia, or dysphagia. Uh, also, presence of neck stiffness or neck pain, which may uh, which may suggest a presence of torticollis or spasm of the uh, prevertebral muscles, and then also drooling of saliva, uh, then neck swelling. All these are red flags, but uh, this flex red flags are heightened uh, when uh, there is presence of respiratory distress such as trido and dyspnea and then also presence of chest pain that may uh, suggest possible extension into the mediastinum and then cns manifestation such as uh, uh, loss of consciousness and uh, convulsions and also, uh, one have to look for uh, a possible etiology, such as a prior history of upper respiratory tract infection, such as rhinitis, otitis media with effusion, uh, acute otitis media, also presence of trauma, or prior history of foreign body impaction, as uh, is the case in our index case. Then past medical history that may suggest immunosuppression, such as HIV, or some any form of instrumentation in the throat then uh, the socioeconomic status of the patient and the intervention received. So usually the presentation is uh, in children is acute and the patient may be in respiratory distress or in shock, may be dehydrated. 
and the oral cavity reference examination may reveal presence of a drooling of saliva. Uh, trismus and the hygiene may not uh, be good. And also there may uh, usually in retropharyngeal abscess, the bulge is on one side of the posterior pharyngeal wall because of the uh, partition by the median rough into right and left uh, spaces. Then, of course, the neck examination may reveal presence of swelling, uh, which could uh, mean uh, presence of uh, lymphadenitis or expanding abscess, uh, tenderness in the neck, stiffness, tracheal deviation. Then complete ear and nose examination to rule out uh, prior or present history of a uh, current infection or trauma and then systemic examination to rule out possible complications. So the examination, the investigations of choice include uh, plain radiographs, uh, most importantly, especially in the low resource setting like uh, ours, uh, we utilize uh, plain radiograph, uh, especially the lateral view, X-rays of tissue neck. So of note to pay attention when reviewing the X-ray soft tissue neck lateral view include the following. Uh, the widening of the prevertebral soft tissue shadow uh, in children and also in adults. Uh, when the shadow is greater than seven millimeters, it is regarded as significant. Then at C6 or C5 in children, when it is greater than 14 millimeters, and then in adults, when it is greater than 22 millimeters, it's regarded as significantly widened. Then also uh, the width of the prevertebral soft tissue widening when it is greater than 50% of the uh, vertebral body, it is also taken as significant. Uh, then others include uh, loss of cervical lordosis due to spasm of the prevertebral muscles and presence of air bubbles that may suggest a presence of air forming bacteria and uh, also tracheal uh, compression then presence of foreign body, one has to carefully look at, especially with a very high index of suspicion. Then the AP view, though not very important in uh, establishing the diagnosis of retropharyngeal abscess, but may give an idea uh, as to the presence or absence of tracheal deviation, and of course, the site of the soft tissue swelling. Then for patients who have reported uh, chest pain, uh, it is recommended to do chest x-ray to rule out presence of mediastinitis or pneumonia. <laughs> then CT scan, uh, especially with contrast, is the gold standard. However, the sensitivity, it is not, it's not always high. It ranges between uh, 64 to 100%. Uh, recent study by Boucher et al. reported that uh, CT scan, even with contrast, has a low sensitivity and uh, specificity in differentiating between abscess in the retropharynx and cellulitis, and that uh, X-ray has a very high predictive value and sensitivity. And this information is uh, particularly useful in low resource setting where uh, facilities for CT scan are usually not available. And even when available comes at a fortune, at a very big cost for the patients to afford. Then other investigations include MRI, uh, which is superior to CT scan in soft tissue delineation and uh, can also uh, pick uh, the relationship between, uh, of the abscess with great vessels. The neck ultrasound is also very important, particularly in children, as, I, as mostly it is mobile and uh, the risk of exposure to radiation is not there. Then complete blood count and differential may reveal presence of leukocytosis and commonly, then sometimes there could be presence of anemia. And uh, there could also be presence of uh, electrolyte imbalance due to decreased intake or increased losses, especially in the presence of dehydration as the uh, patients uh, have not been taken orally. Then the aspirate uh, micro microscopy culture sensitivity usually reveal uh, presence of polymicrobial uh, organisms, commonly the group A streptococcus, usually cultured, then other anaerobes such as uh, Fusobacterium as well. And uh, also in TB endemic area, and also especially in adults, it is uh, recommended to do to send specimen for AFB or gene expert for tuberculosis. Then other investigations may include uh, retroviral status, especially when there are histories suggestive of immunosuppression, and then blood culture as well. 
So some differential diagnosis of uh, retropharyngeal abscess may include parapharyngeal abscess and uh, peritonsil abscess for body impaction. So the treatment is usually uh, approached as an emergency, especially in children that uh, present acutely. And uh, it is recommended that all children presenting with a retropharyngeal abscess should be admitted for resuscitation with IV fluid, analgesia, broad spectrum antibiotics. Sometimes there may be need for tracheostomy, especially those presenting with severe airway obstruction uh, prior to drainage. And uh, for small abscesses, less than two centimeters, uh, one can manage conservatively. However, this has been uh, controversial. Some are of the opinion that even if it is less than two centimeter, it is better to drain or aspirate as uh, at least. So uh, conservative management can be in the form of uh, IV fluid analgesia, broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, NG tube feeding. And uh, however, for big abscesses greater than two centimeters, it is uh, recommended that surgical intervention be administered and uh, the surgical intervention is uh, incision and drainage, and the approaches include the trans transoral approach, which is the commonly uh, utilized approach. It is best utilized for localized abscesses, and uh, in children, it is done under general anesthesia, and the patient is usually in the trendelenburg position to avoid uh, aspiration. However, adult may tolerate local uh, anesthesia in a sitting up uh, and can be done in a sitting or prop up position. And uh, sometimes with experienced anesthesis, one can be able to intubate, especially for uh, abscesses that are not uh, very big or that are not compressing on the airway completely. Uh, but if uh, the abscess is too big as and the, there is respiratory distress, one can offer tracheostomy prior to the drainage. And a cruciate incision is made to avoid a reclosure, and then the abscess cavity is drained and then irrigated as well. Another approach is the transcervical approach, and uh, there is a criteria by Choi, uh, by Choi et al., uh, the criteria being uh, for transtravacal uh, approach being diffuse abscess or when the abscess has uh, is present in multiple spaces and also when the abscess is recurrent after initial uh, transoral uh, incision and drainage or when the abscess has spread more inferiorly and also when the abscess uh, is located more posteriorly that is posterior to the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid then it is also ideal for prevertebral abscesses and also especially in adults who have tuberculosis. Then, however, it is said that uh, it is associated with longer hospital stay. And also there may be some associated risks of injury to vital structure. However, a recent study by Maron et al found that uh, there is no difference in the rate of complications following trans cervical approach and also trans uh, oral approach of uh, in, uh, draining retropharyngeal abscess. Another approach is the transnasal approach, which is usually uh, endoscopic, endoscopically assisted. Uh, this approach uh, utilize, uh, uh, allows for the insertion of a catheter transnasally for continuous drainage. And uh, it is hypothesized that it can reduce hospital stay and then avoid unnecessary scar. So these are some of a uh, few complications that can arise from uh, retropharyngeal abscess, upper airway obstruction, sepsis, aspiration, and also uh, extension into other spaces. The commonest cause of mortality in retropharyngeal abscess is uh, upper airway obstruction. So in conclusion, retropharyngeal abscess is a life threatening EMT emergency. Therefore, prompt recognition and institution of a patient targeted appropriate treatment is key to reducing morbidity and mortality associated with this emergency. Thank you for your kind attention. It comes to the end. I will be happy to entertain any question and comments if you have. Thanks so much, Asana. That was really nice. Um, really nice to place and uh, great overview. Professor, do you have any comments or questions? I would like to hear from uh, Charlie and from, uh, from Jess what our policy is with the small abscess. Do we keep them conservatively or do we do them? Probably they're not on the call. They're not on the call. No. Okay. Charles, <clears throat> you have that one. Yes. So, um, my aim is a deep next day for patients in infants. They let us keep the health and age is fine. So, I, 
uh, I'll start with like the clinical presentation. So generally, almost all a uh, series of six patients, all the patients presented visiting this problem of respiratory tract infection, a uh, fever, and leg mass. So if we find find a patient that is that trial, if they may have a suspicion of the disease case of this. Um, unfortunately, like all of our patients that are in our series, they quite large collections that are more than eight centimeters in um, in in at least one day. So they were managed um, uh, surgically. Yeah. We had one case that had a trial of uh, medical management, and it was quite a significant um, um, collection. That's the case that ended up with the what you call the antiviral like peak. Um, yeah, so it didn't, it didn't um, resolve the medical management. So our threshold generally is uh, with symptoms, at least I can tell you, our threshold is generally, you know, uh, the great pressure for taking the data is quite uh, quite good. We haven't had uh, I can't remember if we've had any case of like a small artist. They usually can't they have been treated for at least five to seven days on antibiotics at the peripheral hospitals. And when they come in, they are they usually put large large connections. But uh, in literature, I think there was so much of review that I can't remember where, but it showed that um, you know, in, in the absolute size is uh, more than uh, two centimeters, I think it's 2.2 centimeters. Yeah. And uh, in patients that are uh, less than the age of, um, I think it's 51 months, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, those patients are unlikely to, 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 you know, to, 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 to recover just from the treatment mm. alone. Yeah, so that's kind of the general. There's no consensus in terms of, you know, yeah. it's kind of taken it uh, as a case to case you know, basis. And please, with the other factors that you need to consider availability of theater time. There's also stages prevalent. Some stages will tend to, you know, go in or uh, have a low threshold of taking these patients with different serious infections to theater early, you know, but. Yeah, and availability of resources again, we've got a CT scan in the disposal, see follow up patient in 48 hours, actually see if the resolution of infection may try and medical therapy patients with very small acid research. I think in our settings, we have the resources to move on. Yeah. So I, 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 Urge more on the slightly, you can say, surgically aggressive approach. I'd be a bit hesitant to manage a two centimeter collection in a child, also bearing in mind the average age of these children. You also okay. go that incision and drainage is quick and, and relatively with low morbidity transparently. Whereas the complication yeah. of that abscess extending in terms of sepsis, also, if you go to that child was going to be then subsequently fed with the with nasogastric feeds for an extended period, which was yeah. uncomfortable yeah. and impractical. And then you're also going to, if you are going to monitor radiologically as opposed to clinically, like Charles suggested, you're going to submit the child to more radiation. So I would go on the side of being more aggressive. Maybe if you're in a situation where you think it's more retropharyngeal cellulitis with no kind of drainable collection as such, but I'd probably be a bit more aggressive. And then just another minor thing in, in terms of imaging, I think it's yeah. obviously we constrained by our resources, but the role of MRI would, I would think yeah. is relatively low because one, obviously the cost constraints, but also MRI because of this acquisition time and this age group is going to require sedation or intubation in this potentially challenging airway. So I wouldn't think there's a, a big role for the MRI. And then just also a very minor thing that the 50% rule, I think applies at the vertebral body, applies at C2 and then at C7, it's it's, it's 100% to one full vertebral body or more using yeah. the soft tissue column. Okay. Um, yeah. I was the drainage, I don't need to go extension down into the, into the leg and telephone to a space. 
And I think uh, really most most value is to is to is to do it. Mm. I think that uh, you know I mean, they say there were no difference in publication, but they didn't talk about the star and other issues that they were I mean, certainly I would be quite good to do that without <coughs> Did you have a case recently? So I only mm -hmm. knew about two weeks, three weeks ago, an eight month old with a very big retropharyngeal abscess extending. And I think he ended up draining about 20 moles for me. So wow. eight month old. And I was stuck with the challenge. It was a possible superior reader spinal collection, which we couldn't get hold of probably a Jurassic store and a minor, very, very limited extent into the parapharyngeal space. And then I wasn't sure whether to go to trans cervical. Obviously, trans cervical carries certain amounts of morbidity with the scar, and there's also critical structures in your park. But I just felt with the superior media spinal collection and uh, being a big collection, okay. maybe my thought process was wrong. But I I read trans cervical and trans orally, but obviously, the majority of the past pus trans orally, but also read trans cervical. Didn't get a lot of the drainage transpiring with the thought of the benefits in terms of superiority to sign of drainage and leaving a drain in the, in the gravity dependent area might might be a pathway. But again, I think that was the exception it was a large yellow extent and could have shifted into other deep neck spaces, as you mentioned. They come from Zimbabwe. <clears throat> so from Zimbabwe, we tend to operate all our all our patients because uh, we don't have enough facilities to do serial monitoring in yeah. the children from the neurological monitoring. Even sometimes the nesses, the nesses is that when you want to pick up your child who is deteriorating and uh, resources to keep a child in the hospital and uh, putting them in the end field, sometimes we don't have the lives of some limited time. So push for them to operate on them and uh, send them. Okay. Any further comments? I um, know we just have a message yeah. for Dr. Pedrak who says thank you. Very nice presentation by uh, Dari Hassan. Thank you to you, Mati. Please convey my greetings to Professor Fagan. And um, yeah. Okay. Any further yeah. comments? Yeah, so uh, I, I think. Uh, I agree absolutely with uh, the discussions there. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, management of retropharyngeal uh, abscess, uh, the take home message I, I think is uh, the fact that uh, there is no harmonized protocol for the management of uh, retropharyngeal abscess. It is usually individualized and then center-based. Like in our center, what we usually do is to, uh, we don't do conservative management, uh, because I know the literature say that a uh, patient presenting with uh, an abscess not greater than 2.5 or 2.2 or 2 centimeters should be managed conservatively. But uh, we never get to see this kind of uh, small abscesses. Mm -hmm. Most of the abscesses that present to the hospital are large abscess causing symptoms, upper respiratory uh, airway obstruction. So we go straight ahead to do uh, surgical drainage. And uh, in most cases, is the transoral route. And I think that has basically to do with the convenience and expertise of most of the surgeons. Uh, personally, I've not witnessed a trans cervical incision and drainage of uh, retropharyngeal abscess. Uh, but I think perhaps it may have to do with uh, competencies and uh, also the comfort of the surgeons managing uh, such kind of cases. And uh, so basically it's individualized and uh, we don't have uh, access to CT scans and MRI here, so we rely heavily on, we have a CT scan, but it comes at big fortune for most of our patients. So, but we rely heavily on the uh, X-ray soft tissue, make the lateral view. And uh, lots of studies have shown a good correlation, especially in terms of predictive value uh, between X-ray soft tissue, neck lateral view and findings of CT uh, scan at least in establishing the presence of retropharyngeal abscess. However, it does not really tell you if the abscess is really restricted only to the retropharyngeal space or it has gone to uh, other spaces such as the parapharyngeal space and other deep neck spaces. So I, I appreciate the 
the contribution so far. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank you.